Welcome to the next chapter of As the Story Grows. I'm Brian Patton. This week, I'm stoked to share my chat with audio karate frontman Arturo Berrios. Audio Karate just released Otra last Friday on Iodine Records. These interviews are always fun for me because I get to discover a band I missed out the first time around and become a fan. Arturo talks about the punk scene in the early 2000s and how Audio Karate got lost in the shuffle and how the band found themselves in a place to release new music over a decade later. Make sure you give Otra a spin, and if you haven't checked out the rest of Audio Karate's discography, I highly recommend giving it a listen. You won't regret it. Enjoy this week's chat with Arturo Berrios from Audio Karate. I'm actually, let's see now, it's been two weeks since I um, got COVID for the first time. So this is two weeks. Uh, so this is pretty good timing in terms of just where I was. Probably like four or five days ago, I probably wouldn't have been up for this. Oh, but. man. Oh, man. How, how was your COVID case? It's pretty rough. No, luckily, it was on par with like a bad cold in terms of the symptoms. What was weird about it was the sort of the secondary phase of it was right when I started to feel better, like the cold symptoms went away. Um, I was super fatigued, had like chest pains when I tried to exert myself, like even just walking my dog. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't loss of smell so much as what smells became. So like vinegar smells like, and I still haven't gotten over it, vinegar smells like ammonium, which is really strange. So like hot sauce smells like chemicals, like you're not supposed to ingest it. And then... um, burnt anything burnt or caramelized gets really like all i smell is the burnt i don't smell like the toasty deliciousness of it so it's been it's been a strange adjustment other than that i'm doing okay thank goodness and um yeah so it's been it's been okay so far oh man that's that sucks yeah it it, seen it like run through like my my sister's family like all her kids got and everybody but my sister and like my mom and it's just like we're in that phase where it's like everybody's getting it now. Yeah, so everyone's like, getting. Where, where are you? I'm sorry. Are you in the East Coast? Oh yeah, DC. Yeah, it's it's pretty much running rampant over here. So it's I think yeah, at this point everybody's like, look, it's we're gonna get it. So there's nothing we can do. Yeah, yeah. Just brace yourself as best. Yeah, you exactly. Just prepare. Yeah, and just take vitamin C and be prepared, and that's yeah. it. Yeah. Oh man. Well, I'm glad you're doing better. Glad you're I am. Thank you. It. Yeah. Glad it wasn't worse. Yeah. Thank thank God for vaccines or variants that aren't so bad <laughs> like, yeah right a combination of both yeah, yeah. Uh, I think my, my body was ready for it oh man well uh i'm stoked to talk to you i've been like jamming the discography uh last few days and uh i'm excited Aud- audio karate was a band i missed initially on there many people did band. yeah <laughs> 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 like it's funny when i think about 2002 i'm like yeah no this fits for exactly the time frame it hit but it was like I feel like that punk wave and that ska wave were, they were a wave. It went up and it crashed super fast and did not have any like mainstream attention. It was like, yeah, all these like bands a, got signed and then all the air got sucked out of the room and like a meme stock. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Glad you're back though. Yeah. It's good to be back. Um, you know, that was, you know, the band uh, disbanded and kind of went their, their ways. And that was, that was a big, a big tenant for uh, Jason, who is the guitarist for the band, is is kind of spearheaded a lot of us kind of coming back and sort of us reimmersing ourselves into the whole kind of being a band thing. And that was one of his big things: was hey, a lot of people, a lot of people missed us, and they never really heard us back when we were around. Maybe now we give those people an opportunity to at least make a judgment on us. Doesn't mean yeah. that they're gonna like us, but they're like, "Oh, okay, this band was around. Okay, now let me listen to them. Okay, yeah, they're cool." Or, "Nah, there's a reason that I, I did." <laughs> and I think that's fine. And I, I think that was the idea. Of, uh, that was a big part of why Jason wanted to do it. And at first, I was kind of like, "Okay, I guess that's important." And then now that I'm in it, I'm like, oh, "Okay, I get it. That this is kind of yeah. cool." It, yeah. Was your approach in reuniting 
like different in just like the whole music scene and the way you share everything has shifted so much was it like all right we have these social media tools we're mm-hmm. going to use we have this digital platform and we need to be more strategic as opposed to just like write 10 songs go to the studio put it out on cd for right. our asses off <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like I completely wasn't prepared for it. Again, I credit to Jason for sort of being savvy enough to know what was needed to be done. But I was like, well, our drummer is like the most social of us. So, hey, you run the social media and everything will be fine. And that was as far as I took it. And I think Jason was like, nah, dude, like there's there's quite an undertaking here. So I had a a band like a sort of a a version of audio karate uh, called Indian School that played after. And so we had a little bit of an understanding of social media and how, how how that that had changed in terms of how a band is marketed and looked at and all that stuff. But yeah, I, I wasn't completely prepared for it. Yeah. There's a lot. Yeah. But yeah. this is fun. I mean, this was something in podcast was not something I was doing when I was 20. Like you couldn't talk on like AIM or anything like that. You could, right. but it was lame. Uh, yeah. I, I remember doing AIM interviews for a fanzine. <laughs> yeah i probably i'm joking but i probably did do an interview <laughs> yeah just like typing questions getting your yeah yeah, yeah. Like, hold on i'm buffering no that's not what i meant to say <laughs> yeah uh it's so funny oh uh, man uh well let's let's go back what uh, initially got you into music oh wow um let's i mean i mean again it, we're i'm dating myself here but I mean, back then, you know, there wasn't internet. So it was really just your older brothers and what your older cousins were listening to. Um, I got, I think I got conscious of music at about 11, 12 years old, where I was like, oh, what do I like? And it happened to coincide with, again, I'm dating myself, but that was when grunge broke. And that ended up kind of being the gateway drug for me for, for punk rock as well. Um, because once I started getting into Nirvana, I'm like, oh, they're like into like punk rock. And then that's right around the time Green Day starts to break too. And um, and that kind of, yeah, made the transition for me of getting into bands like Black Flag and Descendants and the Germs and the Buzzcocks. And at, then at some point it was like, well, if these guys are playing guitar, like surely I can play guitar. And then right around that time, the, the, the first inception of what was audio karate, we all went to um, like primary school to like a grade school together. Uh, they first started jamming right around that time. And then at that point, I kind of made up my mind, like, all right, I'm going to learn how to play guitar and I'm going to be in the, in a band with these guys, whether they like it or not. And that's kind of what ended up happening. That's awesome. Yeah, it's one of the great things about like punk rock is it's like there's a simplicity to it that you're just like, yeah, I can play these three bar, bar chords as fast as I can and let's just fucking go for it. Like, Right, yeah, yeah. And I, and I, I think too, you know, for me, it was again, like two, I learned to play guitar basically by listening to two punk bands and that was Descendants and Buzzcocks. And what's cool about those two bands specifically, if you really listen to those records, the guitar playing is just a couple of notches above the three chords. And I'm like, okay, I want to do that. Like, I want to kind of have like a, a, a cool color or a touch that's kind of my own. And, and, and I listened to those records and those bands specifically for that. Yeah, that was awesome. Where did the name Audio Karate come from? <clears throat> we stole it. Uh, we stole <laughs> it. From, <laughs> we stole it from a band from San Diego, California called No Knife. Uh, they're this really great band. If you've never heard them, um, super math rock, total like mm-hmm. nerd out, get high if that's your thing. Uh, not my thing, but um, <laughs> and uh, they did an interview and they described their sound as Audio Karate, and so. I believe we asked permission and we never got a response. So we just took artistic liberty and just went with it anyway.
you guys get connected with Kung Fu Records? Um, so we were just starting out as a local band, kind of just gigging wherever we could. Um, we made our first demo, which I believe was six songs. I had it burned on a CD. Didn't even have our band name on it, I don't think. I think it just had my telephone number, um, maybe my email. And we went to go see the Ataris uh, somewhere in Southern California. Uh, I recognized Chris Rowe. I saw him. He happened to have like a like a satchel, like a bag. So my immediate was like, okay, he can at least put the CD in the satchel. So I'm not totally like punishing him by being like, you have to carry this now. So I gave it to him. He was really cordial and nice. Didn't think anything of it. Two weeks later, Ataris were signed to Kung Fu Records, uh, which was run by Joe Escalante, the Vandals, and he... I came home to a voicemail and it was Joe Escalante. And he's like, Hey, I like you guys. Um, I'm interested. And that was it. That's awesome. That's awesome. What was that initial wave? Like you kind of come in like the warp tour, like blink explosion. Like what was it like jumping on that scene? Um, it was, I mean, it was cool. There was, there was a, a platform for us to sort of jump into within the Kung Fu network with kind of blink, putting their first record on there and uh, the Ataris, they were about to sign to a major, but were still kind of involved with the Kung Fu family. Uh, Tsunami Bomb was a band that they had just signed. So we were, it was nice to be able to just kind of plug in and be like, okay, here's the family of bands that you can kind of play with and that are kind of kind of show you the ropes. And then as well as sort of the, yeah, at that time, what the third wave or fourth wave of punk rock was sort of the warp Tour, still sort of the fat record sort of bands there um kind of paving the way so it was neat to kind of get up get kind of thrown into that but then our band was always kind of a weird band to peg so that we were kind of starting to veer into the indie stuff which was kind of the emo screamo stuff that was starting to kind of mm -hmm. come into yeah into sort of the the music scene so we were always kind of like are we seen as like a get up kids or are we seen as like a lag wagon we don't really know and they, no one else seems to know, so whatever. We'll just we'll play and we'll figure it out. Yeah, my thought was Audio Karate is a little bit like, what if the Get Up Kids just played Four Minute Mile for every record? Yeah, it was a little angrier. <laughs> yeah, a little a little bit pissier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a little angrier. Get Up Kids doing Four Minute Mile all the I time. I can't I can't uh, disagree with that uh, with that assessment. So sure, yeah, that sounds. Yeah. That's probably <laughs> Was it really like tough in a sea of punk bands to be like have something that makes you like stand out above the rest? Like Blink, Blink, and Green Day being cream of the crop, and then there was like right. second tier bands, and it's just like people who like that genre of music probably found your band and had that CD. But like, is it tough to be like, hey, we're here too, when a yeah. whole other band like trying to do this thing? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it, it's it's always it was always a challenge to like to stick out um and it's sort of like the the challenge is sort of uh, also has to do with like how far do you sort of want to i don't want to say sell out but how hard do you want to try mm -hmm. in order to stick out like where is the line between are we just really trying to just sell to people and get fans or are we actually trying to tra stay true to what we do and be artists i think we ultimately veer on the side of just being ourselves and sort of having a we don't give a shit what yeah. people think and i think there's a price to pay for that um so that that was the difficulty for us is like where do we how far do we go in terms of hey look at us <clears throat> and when where where does the, the line get drawn uh that was always a challenge for us yeah 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 your second record lady melody uh was one of my favorite i love like the song titles on that uh, Jesus is alive and well and living in Mexico is like, phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, that was. Uh, are you are you allowed to? What's what's it? Can I talk about uh, drugs? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, okay. Go I don't mean it's not like I was a heroin addict or anything, <laughs> or anything. But uh, I think by the time that that record came around, um, 
I had sort of, I wasn't really sure like lyrically and thematically where to take things. Um, I knew that the record was a departure from our first record, which was again, more of that kind of get up kids, kind of indie ish pop punk kind of thing. And we had clearly taken a, a pivot musically. And so I'm like, well, how do I match this lyrically? I know this is angrier. I know this is a little different. How do I kind of come and match this in terms of, yeah, like themes and lyrics. And I got to just thinking about it so much that it was like we were about to make the record and I didn't have anything put on paper. So I basically locked myself in my room for three days with like with pills and some weed and some alcohol and other substances <laughs> and basically just knocked out the whole record in like three days oh, and man. just kind of forced myself. So if anything seems a little weird or murky... <laughs> What led to us expanding? Um, uh, you know, just the truth is we, I think after Lady Melody, I think that was the first time we really, really toured. I mean, like toured, toured. I think 04, I was home maybe a month. We were home, yeah, maybe a month uh, into, yeah, like so 30, 40 days. So we toured just relentlessly in 04 and 05 to the point of just kind of running ourselves into the ground. And I think by then the, the kind of the writing is on the wall, like you're going back to the same, you know, the same venue in Boise, Idaho, and it's still maybe 20 kids that come out if you're lucky, maybe 15. And you're starting to sort of see the work you're putting in is not really working out. We're like, where are we? You know, financially, this is starting to hurt a little bit. We don't really like each other all that much. Like we're all kind of brothers, but it's like even brothers, you know, quarrel. Um, and so I think we were just at a crossroads in terms, and we were burned out. Um, that at first, we just kind of took a break. Like, let's just take a break. Let's take a breather. Let's work on our third record and then see where we are in terms of things. And then we started working on the third record, uh, which ended up coming out not too long ago. But um, And then, yeah, again, we kind of reached that same, you know, crossroads as, you know, some of us were going back to school and, you know, we had bills to pay and the Jason, the guitarist, ended up, going to the police academy, uh, the police academy and becoming a police officer. So eventually that kind of just fizzled. Like it just like, look, we're, we're clearly just going in, in different directions and it's best to probably just put this to shelve all this for now and we'll figure out where we are years later. And that's, that's where we came, how we came back basically. Yeah. Yeah. It was just like, we're going to pause and let life run its course. And when we're ready to do the band again, we can pick it up. Yeah. A pause turned into like, what, like, like, more than 10 years yeah <laughs> it, was to, it was supposed to be a year or two but it, it turned into 10 years you show yourself and then you hide away i'll pick you up and get you on your merry way if i know you at all and i think i know you well mentioned indian school what led to you releasing that record under a different name and not just having it be the next audio karate record yeah good good question um the the big thing for me was yeah the jason the guitarist for audio karate which i think is a big part of what makes audio karate sound like audio karate him not being in the band and again yeah just it had been by then what four or five years since audio karate and it just didn't feel right to come back and i can tell by the songs that we were writing that it didn't feel like audio karate whatever that means it just didn't feel like it and i also knew that i wanted to incorporate like a piano player synth kind of person so i was like this is a different project i know that the nucleus is audio karate but it just doesn't feel like it and i and i kind of wanted to do something different and new and and yeah and kind of not have the 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 net or the the backup of hey this is audio karate so 
we have a built-in sort of potentially built-in fan base. I kind of wanted it to be hard. I, I wanted it to be like a new thing. Outside of just time and timing being right, was there any incident that like caused you guys to be like, you know what, now's the time to do more audio parody? You know, I've never actually said this before, and I, I wonder if my drummer's going to hear this. Um, so apologies <laughs> for the personal disclosure. But so, well, so Indian School was playing um, a Riot Fest, and our bass player at the time had just gotten a new job. So it was kind of dicey whether he was going to be able to make it or not. But we knew, like, we have to do Riot Fest. It's going to be awesome. Um, so at that point, we reconnected with um, Jason, our guitarist, and he offered to play bass in in case that our bass player couldn't couldn't fill in and we were all it was the first time we were all in a room together um in years and it was a little awkward but i think we kind of all went back to like our usual kind of way of joking around with each other and it felt comfortable and it was fine but uh we still didn't discuss the idea of audio karate really it was just like oh, okay we can hang out all together in the same room and we're cool and then um our drummer's mom actually passed away um, kind of mm -hmm. suddenly. And um, we were living together at the time. And he was pretty obviously, you know, bummed out about the whole thing. And he's, you know, he was kind of just moping and just like, you know, it sucks. Like at that time, I had another band that I was doing pretty well with. And he was like, you know, you've got your band and everybody kind of has their thing. And, uh, you know, audio karate isn't doing anything. And almost just as a recoil, I'm like, well, I don't know. Maybe we'll do audio karate again. Would that cheer you up? Like, <laughs> <laughs> And it started just as simple as that. And I think at that point, we just, it was like, as soon as the, the feelers were out there, everybody was like, yeah, yeah, right. Like, it's time. Let's do it. And then that was kind of it. That's awesome. How'd you get connected with Wiretap? Um, so right around the, the time of us discussing that, I mean, it might have happened right around that time, I think. Um, one of my other bands was playing some festival somewhere in LA. And Rob from Wiretap was there. And he was like, hey, um, what do you think about me putting out Audio Karate's first record on vinyl? I can kind of get sorted out all the, you know, the, the mechanical legal stuff with Kung Fu. And I'm like, sure. Like, you know, uh, we've been at some point we knew we were going to probably do that. Um, and he's like, you know, just let's put it out there. What do, you, what do you think about you guys playing shows? And I'm like, yeah, I think that's something we can do. Um, and yeah, it just started as innocent like that. And then he uh, he put out the record and then we just kind of supported it with shows and the rest is history. that record sonically like blows away the early stuff like bounce as an opening track like there's so much like anger and frustration in that song it's like yeah. audio karate came back pissed off <laughs> <laughs> that's why i wanted that to be the opener too we were discussing about like what should the opener be and i'm like it should probably be bounce i think it's yeah it, <laughs> it kind of sets the tone uh that's awesome you guys uh are now with iodine records yeah yeah that's pretty cool um that was an unexpected thing that was again just i can't the situation kind of like what you described like kind of missed the band i think casey also never really took notice of the band back when we were around mm -hmm. and then through us kind of coming back into the fray we just kind of slowly got in contact with them and became friends with them. And then the next thing you know, it's like, hey, what do you think about working together? And we're like, okay, sure. You know? So awesome. he's, he's been great. Yeah, he's, he's been great. He's, he's completely like, you know, revitalized the label. Um, so we're excited over like what he's doing and he's been super supportive. It's been, it's been really cool. Yeah, Iodine's like super cool because every time they announce a new band, it's like this band you forgot existed or has members from bands you used to like. And you're like, yeah, oh, shit, Jerome's Dream or Darling yeah, Fire. Perfect Audio for us. Karate. Like, it's great. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the new record how do you pronounce the new record i don't want to fuck it up <laughs> uh no it's fine it just it means uh like like one more or other but uh otra o-t-r-a otra yeah awesome march 18th um how, how did COVID affect you guys and like you released a record in 2019 what was like led to this record and how did COVID affect you guys and continuing forward yeah, I mean, like so many, uh, we, you know, I, I, I was actually uh, listening to your podcast and some of the episodes and like, I, I like listened to like the first 10 minutes of the last three and like, I, it's all, I feel bad. It's like every musician kind of has the same story. You can just hear right, it. I know. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, I'm like, I'm not, we're not that bummed out about that. But like, I, I, and I feel for those bands, but um, I think because at that point by, by then uh, our guitarist had moved to Oregon um. I believe he had just had his kid as well. And we all, you know, we all work and are married and, you know, have all that adult stuff going on. So I think by the end of 2019, we were kind of planning to kind of not stop, but just take a break and kind of like, all right, I'm in Oregon now or my guitarist is and he's going to figure that out. And so we played like an end of the year sh local show. And that was kind of the idea, like we're going to take a break. So it kind of lined up for us. Okay. In terms of that, mm -hmm. um, if I'm being honest, I'd say COVID basically set us back, I think a year, because what we would have probably done in 2020 is what we did in 2021, which is, okay, let's kind of do some stuff behind the scenes, hooking up with iodine, um, getting this release ready, um, recording new music and kind of getting ready for, new shows in the new year. Like it, it basically set us back a year. So, yeah. cause now 2022, we're now going to start playing shows. We've got this release. All that would have happened a year ago. You know what I mean? In early 2021. And we would have yeah. done all that stuff behind the scenes in 2020. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm so sick of the COVID question because it's like almost two years now where I'm like, how did COVID, but it's still like fucking up people's lives yeah and, and, I, and, I feel, like, yeah. and I feel for those bands and I, I I get bummed out because I was getting into a bunch of bands that were gonna blow up and were doing really well yeah and the records came out and they're great and they can't tour yeah. and they can't promote it and I'm like dude that sucks I, I like think about how that would have completely killed me at 20 when my band was like doing well and to not have been able to tour like ugh. yeah so I I feel lucky that I'm and my band's at an age where it's like, we'll be okay. We're fine. Um, yeah, it's, but I do feel for those bands. Yeah. Yeah. It's a project for fun and creativity more than livelihood at this point. <laughs> yeah. It, it, and I, yeah, I admit I, I'm grateful to not be a full-time musician for it to just be a side hustle for me because I, I don't, I don't even want to think about how stressful that is for some musicians. Yeah. That's yeah. tough. And I know, I know firsthand because I've talked to these musicians and some of them are struggling. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what are any, you have any lyrical themes you were exploring or you're going through on this new record? All of them are a thread. Not so much just because it's all kind of thrown together. Um, so there's a little bit of the lady melody kind of angsty stuff on there. Cause there's a couple of B sides from there and there's a couple of the Malo stuff, which is also kind of pissy. And then there's like literally like super sappy love stuff from space camp because there's space camp B sides on there. <laughs> so there's no real there's no real harmony in it um but i think it's cool i mean um we you know i think our thinking was we're big fans of bands who um who just released everything they had like yeah. every b-side every live track uh the smiths were really known for for doing that and so we wanted to kind of be that like look by the end of the day everything that we've ever recorded and done is going to be available to listen to. And this is kind of one of our last, here's everything we've got, and, and here you go. Awesome. What's the future look like? Are you going to tour this? Is, I mean, I, I feel like at this point, you'll never say never that the band will be done. Like, Right. Yeah. 
yeah, I mean, it's it's a, it's a it's a good position to be in for us again, where we're not relying on this financially, so we can we can kind of decide what's best for the band and what's fun. I mean, the way let's face it, what, what, the way we look at it is, you know, festivals and stuff like that are subsidized vacations. Like, we're probably going to take a loss, but we're going to have a great time in Florida, and fuck it. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of where we are. Like, I think realistically, we're kind of. I mean, it's weird to put a number on it, but yeah, I'd say 16 to 20 shows a year, probably maybe like weekend warrior stuff, a weekend here in Texas, a weekend in Northern California, trying to make arrangements to finally get to the East coast, which we haven't done um, a festival here or two. Um, yeah. Kind of just seeing kind of what's cool and what we want to do and what's fun. Um, yeah. The ball's in our court and that, that that's kind of where we want it to be. Because you're on a label like Iodine, who's like has these like older generation of bands, it's easier to just be like they're supporting you, putting out the music, and there's no pressure on you to like play the shows or sell X number of records to like be successful. It's just like they care about the music so much and want to help you guys out. Yeah, and you can modify you could modify that as a label and as a band. Um in terms of what's expected with like physical output, like don't, don't make 10,000 records of vinyl because you're probably not going to sell them. Right. Uh, you make the appropriate sort of, you know, predictions of what's going to work in terms of the bottom line and the band can meet that expectation. So yeah, Casey's been totally cool about it. I think he understands where we are as a band. listening to As the Story Grows. Our intro music was written and composed by Jeremy Hunt. The As the Story Grows theme is by Bob Nana. If you like what you hear, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and give us a rating and review. If you'd like to support the show financially, you can join us at patreon.com slash as the story grows. Be a part of our community and join the ongoing conversation over on Discord. If you enjoy this episode, share it on social media with your friends. Much appreciated, and thanks for listening. I never felt so young and alive as when I'm diving into a tomb. And now I'm learning as I listen along, and the wheels are turning, and I start a song. What good word, and I'm gone. Oh, 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 oh,
花。